Now we would listen to Haris Halilovic. Uh, if you allow me uh, 90 seconds of personal excursion, which I think could be justified as a way of introducing Haris. Uh, when I go to Sarajevo, I always visit uh, uh, a monument which lists the names of children killed during the siege. Uh, in Potočari, near Srebrenica, I also read names, and these names uh, are pointing to those who used to be human beings, but they are no more, if you remember Sheila's uh, movie yesterday. And they are just names today, and memories of them are fading. Even those close ones, uh, they uh, have difficulties after 20-something years to remember uh, their loved ones as they used to be. And then there is another futile question, uh, what would have become of them had they not been killed? And this is something, the question is futile because we can never know that. But I still think that we should uh, ask this question. And I don't mention this by chance, uh, namely Haris lives by chance. He survived Srebrenica uh, due to uh, uh, a, comple com com a complex of circumstances which were beyond his control, but some uh, 100 members of his extended family were killed there, and you can read their names in Potocari. Uh, and Harris is today uh, a professor and researcher at the University of Melbourne, and he is the author of this uh, book, which is an award-winning book, uh, it is called Places of Pain, Forced Displacement, Popular Memory, and Translocal Identities in Bosnian war torn Communities. So uh, I think that at least we, the Serbs, uh, should always think uh, how many uh, life opportunities were violently cut short uh, thanks to certain reading of our, of our good. And we are happy and lucky to have Haris and he would be uh, talking today about reimagining re and reimagining, reimagining and reimagining the war, the role of visual records in constructing memory and identity in post-war Bosnia. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Nenad, and uh, thank uh, Chaba, and thank everyone uh, who, uh, in any way, helped uh, get this event. Uh, to take place here. Just a short, you know, small dis disclaimer. Uh, I don't see myself as a survivor, not because I, want, I would like to take any distance from Srebrenica where many of my relatives and friends uh, perished, but because I was not there uh, at the time. And uh, I reserve this uh, status of survivor to actual, you know, people who, who were eye eyewitnesses and went through uh, some of those ordeals. Nonetheless, uh, I am affected what happened there, and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm clear about that and transparent. And thanks, Nenad, for bringing it up, even though I was a bit uh, not ready for that. Um, like some other of, of uh, us here, I also did some radical trimming of my paper, so I'm starting somewhere in the middle almost, just to make sure that I don't uh, take uh, too long in presenting. But in doing so, I uh, made a decision to... Um, still to stick to some stories that I would like to, to share with you here. So my paper looks at how memories and narratives are constructed from both directions, from above through TV broadcasts and from below through creation of an uh, attachment to personal visual records. It focuses on the affective relationship between the visual recordings of the ordinary people who are both protagonists and spectators of the events that profoundly impacted on their personal and collective identities. As Bosnian journalist and author Kemal Kurspahic observed, the Bosnian war became a prime time crime, watched on TV by millions of people in their living rooms across Europe and the world. The TV imagery created a meta-reality of the war, not only for the outsiders, but also for the actual protagonists, real events becoming more real as they were recorded and broadcast. In the process of recording and transforming actual events into news, television played a, played a central role in mediating, adjusting, and fixing the memories of war for many ordinary Bosnian citizens, both those who remained in the country and those who had become refugees. Such TV-mediated memories were often adopted as the viewer's lived memories. At times, even the survivor's memories, it means those who witnessed the events firsthand were altered to include the dominant memories as they got officially recorded and represented on television. 
Memories as expression of, our, of identities embodied in concrete individuals and groups are actively constructed, maintained and adjusted through performative enactments. Performance of memory and its construction is a deeply meaningful cultural process and practice, and like all psychosocial phenomena, it's an action, essentially the action of telling a story. As such, memories are never simple records of the past, but rather interpretative reconstructions that bear the imprint of local narrative conventions, cultural assumptions, discursive formations and practices, and social context of recall and commemoration. Over the last 15 years, I have explored memories and narratives of war among the families and communities in Bosnia and in the diaspora, in Australia, United States, Sweden, and Austria. In particular, I have been interested in the fragmented historical knowledge based on private and local memories, or what Michel Foucault termed popular memory, the memory of those who do not have access to publishing houses, movie studios, or political and cultural institutions. Such fragments of local knowledge and memories often get lost in a, or purposely excluded from the bigger narratives, recognized as official historical knowledge, as it has been the case across um, many places in Bosnia, especially in what has become known as Republika Srpska, in Prijedo, Foča, Višegrad, or Zvornik, for instance. The reason being that these popular memories tell a different story from what has become the official truth in the, these places. As such, these popular memories act as, alter as alternative truths and counter-memories, forms of resistance from below to memory-making and unmaking projects from above. In other instances, local memories get appropriated by nationalist discourses by claiming to represent them, selectively appropriating these memories and turning them into fixed memories and generic blanket interpretations of the history of suffering of their own people as it has been the case with the Srebrenica genocide, for instance. What often happens is that these different and convoluted memories and discursive practices are based on the same visual representations of the war, especially those broadcast by television. When narrating their personal memories of war, many of my participants would start with generally shared or mediated memories rather than what they might have individually experienced and remembered. They would incorporate in their personal narratives the events they only indirectly experience as TV viewers, sometimes even many years after the events were shown for the first time. For instance, many of my Bosniak informants would start their narratives of the war with the famous speech Radovan Karadzic delivered in the Bosnian parliament in October 1991, even though this event took place before the war started. Uh, as it's now widely known and written about in his speech, Karadzic warned that the Bosnian Muslims will go into extinction if their political leaders persisted with a call for an independence of Bosnia. For many Bosnians, apart from those sitting in the parliament on the day, this was a mediated memory, TV news. Nonetheless, for many it has become a very personal, lived memory, as if saying, I was there and saw it with my own eyes. One other event has deeply impacted on memories of war of many Bosnians. For many, the scene which came to symbolize the war and its destructive, senseless nature was not a hate speech seen on TV or an image of a dead person, but rather the destruction of a building, the Bosnian National University Library or the famous Sarajevo Vječnica. The deliberate targeting and setting ablaze of Vječnica destroyed the largest collection of books and written documents in Bosnia-Herzegovina, some two million books and more than 200,000 rare historical documents and unique manuscripts were destroyed. The scene of the burning library was broadcast by many international TV stations in real time, resulting in a wide international condemnation of the act of destruction of cultural heritage. Many Bosnians had adopted, adopted this destruction of the National Library into their individual and collective memories, though many, were, many of them were actually not present there. Stana Zahovic, a Sarajevan, recalls the destruction of the Vječnica in Sarajevo as vividly as if it just happened yesterday. She describes countless number of burning books and the flames and smoke reaching close to her house. In reality, Stana watched the burning library far away from her house overlooking the Vječnica on TV in a refugee center in Germany. However, the sense of personal loss and media coverage of the event made her adopt the image of the burning Vječnica as it would have been seen from her own house at the time. It became Stana's lived memory, something that happened to her personally, regardless of where she was physically at the time. 
The fact that since her return home in 96, she had been watching the ruins of the burned down library on a daily basis until it was finally rebuilt in 2014 might have contributed to how she adopted this collective Sarajevan memory into her persona. Other tragedies that received, that received TV coverage, like those in Predor and Srebrenica, have also been internalized by many Bosnians who might have not been or even visited the places they saw on TV, but nonetheless, they remember them. These well-known images and mediated memories have become a shared cultural memory about the war and victimhood, demonstrating how individual memories are fluid and susceptible to outside influences such as television. In other instances, rather than making them open to changes, appropriations, and interpretations, television and other visual media might have fixed certain memories and narratives about particular events and people. After being recorded in some of their darkest moments and appearing on TV screens, a number of individuals had become well-known or popular beyond their imagination or desire to be so. One such person is Fikret Alic. His name will always be linked to the images of the 92 concentration camps in Priedor. Before he was detained and tortured in the notorious camps, he was just an ordinary guy in his 20s. At the camps of Omarska in Ternopole, he was just one of the inmates, even though there was nothing ordinary what he and other imprisoned men went through there. But Fikret Ali stopped being an ordinary man in the summer of 92 when his starved body, body behind barbed wire appeared on TV and on the front page of many newspapers across the world. While the image taken by Penny Marshall at Valimi and their colleagues might have saved Fikret's and the lives of many other detained men at the time, it also fixed Fikret as a perpetual concentration camp survivor, a detainee, a survivor, a victim, the living skeleton behind the barbed wire. Since surviving the Priedo concentration camps, Fikret has done or had attempted to do and be many other things, including returning to his devastated village and rebuilding his home there. However, not just his picture from 92, but also his name and his persona continue to represent the collective memory of the Bosnian concentration camps. He often feels uncomfortable for being famous and remembered for those reasons. The true heroes and symbols are those who did not make it, he insists. Thousands of people who survived the war did not get ex their experiences filmed or written about like Fikret. Some of them were at or close to the actual places where famous or infamous TV recordings were made. While unlike Fikret Alic, these survivors and witnesses do not appear in the actual video or image, their own memories and narratives often include the images that they feel as representing and confirming their experiences. Over the last several years, I have interviewed many Srebrenica survivors, mostly war widows, about their memories of the fall of Srebrenica. Their testimonies are full of guilt, of, but also reflecting their strength and stoicism as if to validate their subjective memories against the objective evidence materialized in well-known televised images and scenes, um, they frequently make references to infamous statement General Mladic made into TV camera upon entering the deserted town of Srebrenica. Many Srebrenica genocide survivors often feel that they are expected to embed their personal memories and tragedies into an overarching narrative of the Srebrenica genocide, selectively including the known images, the TV scene with General Mladic, the mastermind of the, and the man in charge of the Srebrenica genocide becoming an inevitable part of the narrative. Parallel to what was officially recorded and reported by local international professional journalists, ordinary people were creating their own visual records about their life in the war. Filmed mostly on VHS home cameras by video amateurs, they became a widely popular mode of creating and communicating war video postcards or video letters smuggled out of besieged cities and towns to relatives and friends in, uh, out of the country. There was a two-way flow of VHS tapes from and into the besieged Bosnian towns and cities. Most had very personal content direct directed to the intended recipients, providing them with details about everyday life and sending the greetings and good wishes for many the tapes were the only way to see and hear their loved ones since they got separated by the war. I'd love to greet my son Amar and to tell him that I love him, that I think of you every day and night. Study hard over there and listen to your mother. The war will be soon over and we'll be together. VHS recording, Srebrenica, 1994. This is where the shell hit our apartment. Neighbor Meho was killed. We were hiding in the basement. 
Thank for the parcels you sent. It means a lot that you are thinking of us. We miss you. We are just recording Sarajevo 1993. Many refugees outside of the country send their video letters back home to Bosnia. We are well and you don't need to worry about us at all. The kids go to school. It's a Bosnian school, but they are learning Danish fast. Copenhagen Refugee Center, Flotilla Europa 1992. These are some of the extras from numerous VHD tape, VHS tapes that were recorded and sent to relatives in both directions. The personal VHS as tapes are especially important for learning about life in besieged towns such as Srebrenica, where hardly any TV crew ventured during the four years of conflict. But by being quite rare uh, and remaining in private hands, these tapes provide exceptional insights into life in, under siege and the UN safe area before it was overrun by the Serb forces, forces 95. Notwithstanding the technical and ethical challenges involved in obtaining and examining these visual records, for ethnographers, historians, and media scholars, they represent a unique uh, source documenting life, pain, longing, and hope of the people in the safe area before it was erased in 1995. Now, I'll just skip uh, description and sh share a few um, images from videotapes taken by, uh, recorded by Ibro Zahirovic. So it's Srebrenica 1992, uh, 1993, and as you can see, um, it's uh, not referring to genocide and, and suffering, but people lived there. This is one of the big public events organized in 1994. Um, there was also a you know, Srebrenica vision song content, so Takmičenje Pjevača Amatera, organized in 1994. Um, in 95. Ibro Zahirovic recorded, you know, a number of people, you know, the characters from Srebrenica, many of them perished, and these are the only uh, visual records uh, or any records of their existence. Um, it was not only uh, the professional journalists, propagandists, and ordinary people who made the videos of war. The perpetrators of crimes also used cameras to put their own crimes on record. Uh, in May 2005, the TV across the world uh, were broadcasting the atrocities from Bosnia yet again. This time it was not a real-time event, but a belated video record, record of a war crime. What was shown was a close-up footage of an execution of six civilians from Srebrenica 10 years earlier. Their hands were tied behind their backs. They looked exhausted, and one of them, a man wearing a blue shirt, asked the executioners, the Serb soldiers, if he could get some water. The request was denied with laughter and abuse by the captors who continued filming. For the family Salkic, now living in Melbourne, suburb of St. Albans, these disturbing scenes watched on the evening news on the Australian public television broadcast SBS could be only compared with a bad nightmare. In that thirsty man in a blue sh shirt captured in the handheld camera, Zifa and her teenage children Saidin and Mubera recognized their missing husband and father, Sidik. The footage showed how Sidik was forced to carry the bodies of four men killed seconds earlier and load them onto a truck. Then how he and the remaining captive were lined up and the gun barrels of the execution squad pointed to their chests before they were gunned down in cold blood. On the other end of the world in Bosnia, Nura Alispahic watched the same video on the Bosnian TV in her temporary refugee accommodation near Tuzla. Seeing the video, she instantly recognized her 16-year-old son, Azmir. I saw him. He was second in the row. They were pushing him. He turns and I see him, and it was my Azmir. Then they shot him. He falls. Sidik and Azmir were gunned down in front of their loved ones, eyes on television. Zifa and Nura keep rewinding these images both in their reality and imagination. Like many other survivors, they have their own memorials and archives, including material evidence that the lives they want, about the lives that they once had and evidence that it really existed. Along the photos in their living rooms, the pictures of Sidik, an ambulance driver, and Azmir, a schoolboy, they also retain a copy of the awful video clip, which now serves as memorializing, uh, as a memorial. Rather than remaining static and objective records of the past, these videos form an effective and dialectical relationship between the viewers and the images of the people, places, and events captured in such videos. 
In my paper, I have attempted to describe some of these dynamics and active interplay between wartime visual records and memories, narratives, and identities in post-war Bosnia and Herzegovina. These are just a few examples. I would have many more. But from today's perspective, the VHS recordings represent a crude predecessor to the digital 2.0 technologies communicating information and emotions. The wartime tapes became an important part of private family archives and personal historical artifacts of the war. In addition to the personal and sentimental value, these superseded visual media constitute, constitute valuable resources about the affective dimension of the everyday war of ordinary people between 92 and 95. A challenge for researchers and practitioners like us is not only how to access, preserve, digitize, and store these tapes, but also how to interpret and contextualize them, and in the process, move this valuable historical knowledge about the war from private into public domain. Thank you very much, and I apologize for a few minutes.